Martin Godwin, who's, who's, sorry, who's a professor of economics at the Menashe Business School. Uh, she's an experimental and behavioral economist, any of you already know her and her work. And today she'll be talking, well, today she'll be talking about gender beliefs and coordination, coordination with externalities. So Lata, welcome. Thank you for making time for us. Floor is yours. Thank you, Zushar. Thank you for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, and today I'm going to share some of my recent work on gender. It's titled Gender Beliefs and Coordination with Externalities. And um, it's joint work with Tim Kaysen, who is at Purdue University in the US, and uh, with Phil Grossman, who is a colleague of mine at Monash. Okay. I'm just going to see if my laser pointer works. Can you see this? Okay, great. So most of the decisions that are made in organizations are made by groups. And there are many examples of you know, what these groups are. For example, you can think of committees or you can think of boards like corporate boards or academic boards at universities. And the decisions that are made by such committees are basically in part driven by the preferences of uh, the people on, on these committees and the characteristics of uh, these people. Gender, of course, is an important and salient characteristic. It's an observable characteristic. We know from the literature that uh, there are gender differences in many different uh, domains in terms of preferences. For example, women are seen to be uh, more risk averse as compared to men. Women are seen to be less willing to engage in competitive tasks as compared to men. In terms of leadership, again, the gender leadership gap can be explained partly by the fact that women may have different preferences as compared to men in terms of willingness to lead. Uh, also in terms of social preferences, um, there, are, there is evidence that uh, in many different contexts, women might be more pro-social as compared to men. Uh, so as I said, there's a huge well-established literature in terms of preferences and gender, uh, and there are many interesting uh, papers in this area. Uh, here I'm just list listing some new survey papers um, which look at these different uh, preferences. Given the fact that there might be gender differences in these preferences, the impact of gender composition of groups is obviously important to understand. And this is particularly so because there is an interest in uh, gender diversity, which seems to be growing over time. So gender diversity is uh, now being adopted uh, in many cases as an explicit policy. You can see that in the corporate sector, uh, many countries are mandating that firms should have at least a certain number of uh, women uh, on their boards, for example, Norway has a mandate that publicly listed firms should have at least 40% female directors. There are similar such policies which have been um, initiated in different countries like Belgium, Iceland, Italy, Malaysia, Netherlands, and Spain. Uh, and in countries where there is no nationwide policy, there's still, there are some states which have uh, mandated such gender quotas for their corporate boards, for example, California. In the uh, arena of politics as well, we see gender quotas. So some of them are legislated gender quotas. In other cases, you see voluntary gender quotas. For example, in Australia, the Labour Party has um, a voluntary gender quota. And these gender quotas are at different levels of the democratic process. Uh, so in India, for example, you have quotas for women in village councils. So in the village elections, the head of the council um, can be mandated to be a woman or a man, depending uh, on a randomized mechanism. Um, in academics also, we are seeing uh, some countries adopting gender quotas. For example, in France and in Australia, the university structures um, have the academic boards and the hiring committees need to have some kind of a gen gender quota. So in spite of this clear movement towards gender diversity, we don't see much rigorous evidence on uh, whether and how gender composition can affect group decisions. So now groups can make many different kinds of decisions. So it's a very broad spectrum in some sense. So let me talk a bit more about what are the kind of decisions that we are interested in in this paper. So the decisions that we are interested in are the ones uh, which impose an externality on passive external parties. 
Okay, and there are many such decisions. For example, corporate boards can make decisions to restructure their firms because of which you may lose a lot of workers. So they may have to fire a lot of workers. Um, so, or they might have uh, corporate social responsibility kind of initiatives, which are going to help the social, com the, the community around them. So there are lots of such decisions which can have some negative or positive externalities on uh, external parties. And we are going to be focusing on the negative externalities. Isn't that true for all of these committee decisions? I'm struggling to think of a committee decision that wouldn't affect external parties. I guess you can have decisions where you don't really have, I mean, it could be just within the organization, right? So you don't really um, affect somebody who's outside the organization, but also more importantly, you don't affect somebody who is not in the board. So you could have some decisions which are just basically, you know, to do with the profitability of the board or, or, the, or the bonuses that the, or the board members get, but it doesn't really have a tension with respect to how much somebody, how it affects anybody else. Right? If you pay the board more bonuses, shareholders miss out or other employ, employees miss out. I mean, I, I understand that. So I, I agree that these are important decisions, which is why we are focusing on them. Uh, but I, I suspect there will be some decisions where, you know, the members can just decide or the, you know, the department can just decide um, something that is just useful for their own members rather than, you know, for somebody else. Okay, but, but it's, yeah, I, I completely agree that this is an interesting area, which is precisely why we are focusing on this. Um, and also many of the group decisions often involve, involve coordination. So what we're going to do in this paper is we are going to use a coordination game. In particular, we are going to use a coordination game with externalities, precisely because of the point that I just raised, uh, that we are interested in these tensions that can come up. So the coordination game is a very useful paradigm and it's used a lot in economics. And it's basically a game where people have to coordinate a one on one or the other option. Um, and it's very uh, useful to understand group decision-making. And the coordination game with externalities basically combines the incentive to coordinate with the trade-off between the decision-maker's own payoff and a desire to be pro-social. So in this kind of a structure, payoff externalities would arise and this could affect equilibrium selection. And that's what we're going to be interested in. So the key research questions that we address in this paper are the following. Does the gender composition of the group influence the group's choices over selfish and pro-social options? And these are the options that are going to affect the external party. Um, how do individual preferences of group members influence this group choice? And how do, what is the role played by beliefs? Do beliefs about the proportion choosing the pro-social option, does it vary according to the gender of the player? And importantly, does it vary according to the gender composition of the group? Uh, Lena, just a quick clarification. Mm -hmm. um, so yes. when you talk about gender, it's a very binary concept mm -hmm. based on biology. Yes. So the men and women in a very con conventional binary sense. That's right. It's, yeah. So in terms of those, more uh, diversified, uh, more gender identity issues or sexual minorities, they are out of the picture. Is that correct? Um, so in the context of the, I think in terms of a broader agenda, you can think of gender, you can think of diversity in many different ways, right? Yeah. Uh, in terms of how we are going to think about gender diversity here, yes, it will be male and female because we are in the experiment per se, the options that we give the subjects are to select, I think we also gave them an open option. And in at least in our subject pool, everybody either ticked male or female. Right, okay. So, which is Got how it. we are classifying them. But you're right, we can do more things. As I said, we already gave them that option, but in our sample, we don't have right. uh, anybody who ticked a different option. No, that's okay, yep, thank yeah. you. Yeah. But that's a good question, though, and I, I guess, um, as I said, in terms of diversity, you can think of diversity in many different ways, right? Okay, so these are the three main research questions that I'm going to try and address today. Um, and I'm going to use that, I'm going to address that using experimental methods. Salata? So, yes. Yes, I'm wondering, can you just to clarify more about these uh, externality you mentioned? So, uh, 
what do you mean by externality here in your context? And what, how do you know it is really externality? Uh, and uh, what, uh, what is relevance to your research questions here? Because I, I, I didn't find anything related directly to externality in your research questions. Can you just clarify? Yes, yeah, so the, the externality would be whether it is a selfish or a pro-social option. So if it is a selfish option, then that means there's going to be an externality on the external party. That's how uh, we're going to define it here. Yeah, but uh, in your context, then uh, how do you know it is really externality? Because it could be some uh, price mechanism that uh, that means that actually even the decision is made by a group, but and it affects another uh, uh, external parties, but there's some price mechanism there. Uh, uh -huh. So I'm wondering why do you know it is really externality? So that's a good point. And I'm going to tell you the precise game that we use. Uh, and hopefully we can revisit this question there. Okay, so I'm going to talk about the game very soon. Uh, so maybe we can postpone the question because then I think I can define the externality more clearly in terms of the payoffs and okay. uh, in terms of the effect on the um, external party. Okay, so thanks for that. So what we're going to do is to uh, try and use experiments to understand these research questions. Um, and the advantage in, in this case of experiments is that it allows for an exogenous variation of gender composition uh, and this helps us to interpret the data in a causal manner. It's also easier to define counterfactuals. In our case, for example, we can define some groups uh, where you have a majority women in the group or groups where you have women in the minority. We can also define groups where you have uh, uniform gender, that is you have an all women group or uh, all male group. Uh, which is actually quite difficult to do using observational data. Um, and in some sense, with many of the other empirical approaches, uh, it's very hard to actually get data relating to female decision makers uh, because of the fact that there are very few such decision makers in the real world, right? Um, and it's therefore hard to define these different kinds of groups where you have all female decision makers or majority uh, decision makers who are women. Uh, also, uh, with observational data, it can be quite difficult to quantify key variables, uh, such as preferences in different contexts, uh, beliefs about how other people are going to react to a, to a context. Uh, and also, there's very, it's very difficult to obtain um, data on communication. That is, uh, what do groups talk about before they make a decision? Um, and with observational data, it can also be sometimes hard to uh, determine the attitudes relating to gender. And one of the reasons why this could be hard is because of uh, the fact that respondents might be affected by the social desirability bias. That is, uh, when they're asked questions relating to gender, they may want to respond in a way that is seen to be socially appropriate or politically correct. And this might obviously mean that they're not really reflecting, they're not uh, telling you their true views on the subject. Okay, so perhaps because of some of these reasons, we are seeing more researchers um, interested in using experiments uh, to understand decision making in the context of gender. Um, and it's also a good complement uh, in, in, with respect to you know, observational data. So you can use both in, in, in some cases to try and understand the mechanisms underlying the results. Uh, excuse me. I mean, just for your last point, this is this is not also the case of your uh, of your setting. Uh, the last point being the social. And it is where gender is difficult to measure even in your experiment because people in the groups. I mean, they're gonna be. They don't wanna. They don't wanna seem to be the bad guys. You know. Right, right. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So that's true. But yeah, so the I guess the advantage here is that it's going to be anonymous. So they don't know whom they're matched with. So they don't know the gender of the other people in the group. They, they will know the gender of the other people, but they don't know who exactly those people are. They just know that they're matched with, let's say, one man or two men in the group. But uh, why does so, rule out this problem? So I, I think it makes it a bit less salient because it's not going. I mean, it's not so with, with observational data, I guess I'm thinking uh, researchers usually need to ask, you know, yeah, ask exactly. So because of which it becomes a bit difficult to uh, you know, respond in a way which is, let's say, socially 
incorrect or inappropriate, right? Uh, so it's a bit more uncomfortable. <laughs> it puts you in a more uncomfortable situation. Whereas in an experiment, there are lots of different decisions you're making. So gender is not even that salient. Uh, so it's much easier perhaps for you to reflect on your own true attitudes. And also experiments are incentivized. So you lose money if you're being politically correct. So, so we think there are some reasons why you can try and reduce this kind of a bias uh, using an experimental method. Okay, but of course you're right, you can't completely uh, eradicate. So let me just give you a quick preview of the results. Some of you, if you have to leave early or if, uh, you, are, if you tune out because it's after all Friday afternoon. Uh, so let me just give you a quick preview of what we find. Uh, social preferences are seen to be very important in our context. So social preferences of group members are a key determinant of the choices at the group level. Groups with more women make pro-social choices more frequently in the coordination game, and particularly so once social preferences of group members are controlled for. We observe a gender bias in beliefs. So what we find is that both men and women think that a higher proportion of women would be choosing the pro-social option in the coordination game. Okay, so let me now get into the experiment. So let me start with a quick overview to give you a sense of what our participants saw in the experiment. Uh, so initially what we do is we uh, give them a short questionnaire and we collect some personal characteristics from them. Uh, gender and season of birth is what we use in the experiment. Uh, they then take part in the coordination game and there are 12 rounds of the coordination game and they have to decide uh, to coordinate on one or the other option. And if they can't coordinate on either of those two options, then they get zero payoffs. And I'll talk about all of this in much more detail in a second. Um, after that, they have to decide about individual allocations where there's, there is no coordination. They just have to decide about which allocation to choose for themselves and uh, for somebody else in the group. Uh, and then, they uh, tell us their beliefs about uh, the proportion of men and women making these kind choices in the coordination game. And they do this at the overall level and also depending on the group gender composition. So these are all uh, parts which are incentivized. Um, the experiments were conducted in the US at Purdue University and the participants are university students. We have collected data from 208 subjects and the sessions lasted about 45 minutes to 50 minutes and they earned on an average 22 US dollars. Okay, so now let me talk about the coordination game and the payoffs and I think that'll uh, hopefully answer some of the questions that we had before about externality. So the sessions had 16 participants and they play in a four person group. They're rematched in every round. So there are 12 rounds and they're going to be rematched uh, in every round. 12 of these 16 participants are assigned as position C players. Okay, so out of these 12, you have six men and six women. And four of the 16 are assigned as passive position Z subjects. And these positions are fixed. So the game is structured such that a pro-social choice by the C players is going to lower their own payoff from seven monetary units to five monetary units, but it's going to raise Z's payoff by 20 monetary units. So you can think of uh, player C's as the committee members, and you can think of player Z as the external party. And since uh, Z's payoff is affected by C's choices, C's decision, we can say, generates a payoff externality on Z. So Z is a passive player and cannot influence this payoff. Let me give you a bit more details about the game and the actual payoffs that we use. So, so it's only positive externality? Uh, uh, it is, no, it's actually negative. So let, yeah, so let me go through the numbers, okay. you're right. So, so as I said, the position C players, they are the ones who play the coordination game and they have two options. So the two options are, you can be unkind to Z. So Z is the uh, external party, or you can be kind to Z. So if you choose this option of being unkind, then all the Cs earn, let's say seven monetary units. 
and Z earns minus 16. So this is a situation where uh, you have a huge negative externality on the external party. Okay. And if the committee members choose the kind option, then all of them earn five monetary units, let's say, and Z earns four. So if they choose the kind option, then, the, then Z is going to uh, increase payoff by 20 monetary units. Right? That's the difference between these two. And if they choose to not coordinate, so if they can't manage to coordinate on either of these options, then what happens is all of them in the group, so all the C players and the Z player, they all earn zero. So not coordinating is obviously very costly for everyone concerned. So that's what the externality is. And what we're going to be interested in is uh, when we vary the gender composition across various rounds, what is the group choice going to be? Are they going to be able to coordinate on the unkind option or the kind option? Whether that will depend on the gender composition. So this is how the uh, gender composition, so you can, you know, this is just an example of how you can think about the gender composition of groups being varied across rounds. So we have 12 rounds and every round you have a new group. Um, so these are just the C players who are, who are shown here. So these are basically the committee members. Uh, so you can see that in the first round, you have um, a, a majority women group, female group. Uh, this is a group where women are in the minority. This is a uniform gender group, which is all female. And this is, a, again, another uniform gender group with all male. And then in the next round, they are matched. They, they go to another group. So a person from this group might be now in a, a majority male group, and so on. And this is going to be randomized across sessions, the order in which they uh, are grouped. And the question that we are going to be asking is, can gender composition of groups affect equilibrium selection? So another feature of our game is that uh, we're going to allow people to talk to each other before they make a decision. And this is usually what you do in committees. Um, so we allow for pre-play chat in all our sessions. And the chat feature basically allows group members to consult and advise each other prior to the coordination game choice. So they get 60 seconds to chat, to chat with each other. These chat sessions are anonymous, so they are just uh, noted as player one, two, three in, in the group. Um, it's free form, so they can basically talk about anything they feel like. However, of course, they can't be rude uh, and they can't uh, identify themselves. Um, the, the chat is also non-binding. That is, you can say in the chat that you are planning to select the kind option, but then go off and select uh, the unkind option. So there is no uh, penalty for choosing one or the other option. So what the literature has uh, shown us is that pre-play communication, even if it is uh, non-binding and cheap talk, even then uh, this helps in facilitating coordination and improving efficiency in coordination games. So which is uh, one of the reasons for also including that uh, in our design, uh, in addition to the reason that in you know, most committees obviously you're going to do have some discussion before you, you come to a decision. So this is a, an example of the screenshot that the subjects see. Uh, see. So they see this every round and this basically summarizes the payoffs. So if all three type C players uh, choose M, so M is actually the unkind option and J is the kind option. So we keep these options neutral. Uh, so we just call them M and J. So if M is chosen, they know that they can all earn seven and Z earns uh, minus 16. And they know that if uh, J is chosen, then all of them earn five and Z earns four. And they also know what happens when they don't coordinate. So in addition to the payoffs, which they're reminded of, uh, they also get to see the characteristics of the other two C players in their group. So they get to see the gender of the, um, of the other players and also they get to see uh, season born. So this is basically um, when they were born. So was it summer, spring, uh, fall or uh, autumn or winter? 
So this is obviously irrelevant information. This uh, shouldn't have any connection with the actual choice that we are interested in. Uh, but the reason to include this was to try and make gender less uh, artificially salient. Um, and also, of course, uh, it has a bit of an advantage because now in the data analysis, what we can do is we can use this uh, and do a placebo test uh, with this to see whether this actually does affect uh, the choices in the, in the game. Uh, as I mentioned before, the members can chat with each other. So this is the section where they can type their messages. Um, and uh, they will appear here and they can try and perhaps coordinate uh, by messaging each other. Next, they take part in an allocation task. So the allocation task has the exact same payoffs as what you just saw in the coordination game. Um, and what position C players are asked to do is to choose between allocation A and allocation B. So allocation A is the same one, which is un unkind to Z, where they all earn seven and the Z player earns 16. And similarly, allocation B is the kind one where C players all earn five and the Z player earns four. The key difference here is that there is no coordination required. This is just a, this is just a, a, a task so, so as to infer their own preferences when they don't have to coordinate with others. And what we do is to make it incentive compatible at the end of the experiment, the decisions made by one of the three position, three players, C players is randomly selected and it's implemented for everybody in the group. Next, as I'd mentioned before, we elicit beliefs and these are beliefs about the actions taken by participants in previous uh, experiments or previous sessions. So we ask them what percentage of men do you think choose M? M, remember, is the unkind option. Uh, and also we ask them another question, which is so it's a separate question where we ask them what percentage of women do you think choose M? We also have questions relating to the group composition. Um, so what percentage of men um, do, you do you think choose M in groups which are composed of two men and one woman? Right? And similarly for all the other group composition um, uh, permutations and combinations. And subjects are paid for, the, uh, for their answer being correct because we have what the previous uh, session subjects did. So we can pay these current subjects using that data. So they are paid depending on how accurate their answers are. Okay. So, so before I show you the results of the experiment, let me just um, talk a bit about the relationship between uh, group composition and preferences and what is the role of beliefs in this, um, in this uh, environment. So let's think of a committee which consists of three individuals, which is exactly what we have in our experiment, who have to choose one of the two payoff allocations. So they can choose either the unkind one or the kind one that they need to support. And in our experiment, these are the um, allocations. So the unkind allocation is you know, where all the Cs get seven and the Z gets minus 16. And the kind allocation is where all the Cs get five and Z gets four. And each committee member could be a man or a woman. And this group identity is common knowledge in most spirits. In some periods, we don't reveal any information about the group members. I think in three of the 12 periods, we don't reveal any information, but in nine periods, they get to know um, who is there in their committee in terms of the gender and the season born. Now, committee members can differ in their social preferences for payoff allocations U and K. And this is what is going to define their type. So their type would indicate how much members prefer to be kind to the outside party or how much do they want to keep the money for themselves. So how much do they want to look out for themselves? So this is a tension between doing the kind thing or you know, just being selfish, right? So you can consider preferences uh, from the lens of the Ferrin Schmidt inequality aversion model where um, you can think about how, how group members are going to get utility from the payoffs that they get in absolute terms, um, but they can also get utility or disutility depending on how their payoffs compare to the payoffs uh, of the external party. 
So in this case, for example, if they earn more than the external party, then they um, might be getting some disutility out of it. So this is the um, uh, this is the idea of advantages inequality. And here it is possible that if the external party is earning more than um, the group member, then they may be exposed to disadvantages in equality. So in our framework, uh, decision makers only face advantages in equality. So this is the only relevant aspect for us. This uh, alpha i is not going to be a relevant uh, aspect for us. Okay, so this is basically supposed to be the NV parameter and this is the altruism kind of parameter. Um, also, in our framework, there is no inequality with respect to the other position C committee members because everyone gets either seven or five or zero if they all miss or if they can't co coordinate. So, in our case, uh, we can think of the utility for these payoffs as if it's an unkind option, then you get this. If it's for the kind option, then you'll get something like this. And the unkind option U is going to be preferred over the kind option K whenever the utility aversion. Uh, inequality aversion term, sorry, is not too high. So specifically, uh, it, it depends on what beta i is, right? So if beta i is less than three by 11, then uh, the unkind option is going to be preferred over the kind option. So when individuals are facing a choice between the unkind option and miscoordination, then only those who have a very strong dislike for advantages and equality are going to prefer to miscoordinate. Uh, so for that to happen, beta i would have to be uh, 21 divided by 23 in our case, using our parameters. So in addition to proposing this uh, inequality version model, uh, Ferenc-Schmidt also proposed uh, distribution for beta. And this is based on a calibration you know, exercise that they did across many different kinds of games, in particular ultimatum games. Um, and what they suggest is that beta i, this distribution for beta i could take these three values, 0, 0 0.25 and 0 0.60. And you may see these proportions for these values. So basically what that means is that 30% in the population would have a beta i of zero. So these are the people who don't care about um, the payoffs for the external party. So you can call them the selfish type, let's say. 30% uh, in the population would have a beta I of 0 0.25 and 40% would have a high beta, which is a beta of 0 0.60. So, so, so beta can never be negative. Um, I guess then you are in the disadvantage you are in the disadvantages in equality range, I guess. Because there's a, a, a recent new Beta. literature. Um, ah, yes, okay, sorry. Can I just mention? So yeah, yeah. so I think if beta is negative in, in this case, maybe what you're thinking of is, do you get utility if your payoffs are greater than another person's payoff, right? Uh, and yes, you can get that if you are status seeking or if you're conscious of rank, so yes, so there are models which look at that as well. So we are just using a very simple setup um, where we are not, you know, specifically assuming that. So, no, no, I, I guess my, my point is to uh, another new literature that some psychologists, they found this. Mm -hmm. um, in certain circumstances when people, people helping other people as a coping mechanism, mm -hmm. So for example, they face a lot of stress and, you know, during COVID, um, they found people are more likely to help others. And that's just the way they cope with their stress by helping others. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, okay. So yeah, so that's, that I think that that's a good point. Yeah. And I guess the way to think about that is, um, I mean, that could be connected to warm glow, let's say, because you get a bit of utility by being mm. a nice person and, you know, by helping other people, mm. right? Um, and you may get more utility if you're helping somebody who is worse off than you. Yeah, well, it's slightly different from yeah. warm glow, but yeah, it's in the same direction, yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So in the case of our application, we can think that the self-interested type who has basically beta i to be equal to zero, 
uh, this kind of type would prefer the unkind allocation. And the most inequality averse type who has a very high beta, um, that kind of a person would prefer the kind allocation. So, and the intermediate type who has beta i to be equal to um, 0 0.25, sorry, that's a typo, that should be beta i not bi. Um, so this, uh, this type is very close to this critical value that we talked about before. So this type can basically uh, choose either the kind allocation or the unkind allocation because they're so close to the critical value. So basically, depending on the type of the individual in the group, uh, we, can, uh, we can see that the group may achieve a kind or an unkind option. Now, when groups are formed, what, what they may do is they chat about which of these choices should they implement. And this helps in, so this communication, this is going to help to reveal their preferences um, to others in their group. And this can help them coordinate towards a common choice. So here are some illustrative examples about how these individual preferences will eventually lead to um, you know, group choices in the coordination game. So if a majority, for example, have beta i to be equal to zero, then it's likely that they'll choose uh, the unkind option. If the majority instead have a high beta, which is 0 0.6, then it's likely that they'll choose a the kind option. If exactly two group members are the intermediate type, uh, then they may choose the allocation which is preferred by the third member with a certain probability. And if the group consists of one member of each type, or if all the three group members are the intermediate type, then the choice likely would be random. So he, these are just examples, of course, but this gives us a sense of how uh, the individual preferences could be connected to the group choice. So when we started off the project, we did some pilots and we actually used uh, three different payoff cases. The first one is the one that I just talked about with you. And this is the one that we are using eventually. But we also had uh, payoff case two and payoff case three. And the, and the main difference uh, across these cases with respect to one is that if the committee members are to choose the kind option, then the external party uh, gets a payoff, which is much higher than what they themselves get. So you can look at 25 and 16 and how they compare with five, right? So what we had expected that is that in payoff case two and payoff case three, it will be very rare to actually uh, see the kind choice being implemented at the group level. Uh, and the reason why that would be is that it leads to disadvantages in equality for the decision maker. So this is a case where they would be much worse off as compared to themselves, uh, as compared to, sorry, the external party. Right? Um, and this is actually precisely what we find in the pilot data only 16% of the position C, C choices um, were, were kind to Z uh, for cases two and three. Okay, so in these two cases, there are very few kind choices. Lata, may I ask a quick clarificatory question? Yes, um, of course. Yeah. Do we know the gender of uh, Z or Z? So that's a good question, actually. I didn't mention that. So no, we don't know those. So as committee members, the gender of uh, Z is is not unknown. known to them. And does Z get to know the gender of the uh, committees that they are uh, linked to? No, no. Okay, because an in, uh, interesting uh, side game could be that once Z knows that he or she is being dissed by this kind of group, how do they react? Absolutely. Okay. And how would they react to let's say a majority male group as compared to a majority female group? Yes, um, and yeah, if absolutely. in the future you shuffle the game and then Z becomes part of C, mm -hmm. then how Z's decision towards the new Z mm -hmm. uh, is going to be affected. So those are all good questions and those are also the reasons why we had positions fixed. Yes, so Z never becomes that. C yes. and C never becomes Z. Yes, so, I understand yeah. that. Yes. Uh, but of course these are uh, I mean, in some sense, empirical questions. So it will be interesting to look at what happens when um, you know you you do know the gender of Z, right? Um, so I think yeah, that's an interesting aspect. We do not study it here, and for and in some sense, we consciously try to stay away from it, just because you know otherwise it would add the number of treatments that we have and add the complications. Yeah. 
but I can see some interesting intuition there, absolutely. Um, so we focus on payoff case one for the reasons I just mentioned. Uh, also, by the way, in the pilot, what we did was we had some sessions where we don't allow committee members to talk to each other. So the position C players, they don't talk to each other before they make the, uh, the choice in the coordination game. Um, and what we found was that um, in the groups where we allowed communication, 95% of the groups coordinated. And in the groups where, co where communication was not allowed, only 33% coordinated. So it seems, as we had expected, that communication is an important aspect of important feature of this game. Um, and of course, in the real data collection, we have uh, all sessions where we have communication. Okay, so importantly, what our pilot data also showed is that men and women have different distributions for beta. Okay. So based on our pilot data, what we did was we calibrated this uh, beta for men and women. So we used the same you know, three value distribution that Fair and Schmidt have, but what we did was based on what we have found for our experiment, we have different proportions for men and women. So what that means is that we have a higher proportion of women in the pilot data who were kind as compared to men. So they have a higher beta. And we have a lower proportion of women who are on you know, the, the selfish side of the distribution as compared to men, okay? Because we have 55% who have the higher beta 0.6 uh, as compared to 30% of the men who have the higher beta 0.6. So, so once we had these uh, distributions uh, for beta, what we did was, you know, we tried to decide what we would do with the data once it's collected. So we, you know, thought a bit about the empirical analysis and try to do some power calculations to figure out uh, how many observations we should have in our sample. Um, and assuming the preference distribution that I mentioned above, um, we collected data from 208 subjects. Um, and this uh, provides statistical power, which is uh, basically consistent with what we see uh, as a prevailing standard uh, in terms of 80% power and 5% significance level. So, so far, what I have been talking to you about is preferences and how do individual preferences have an impact on group choices, okay? Um, and from the discussion so far, we can infer that if men and women have different preferences, it's possible the gender composition of the group may influence group choices in the coordination game. Now, there can be another potential channel through which uh, group composition can affect group choices. Um, and that is a channel which relates to beliefs. These are the beliefs that members have about others' actions. And I'm going to talk a bit about that. Um, but I just wanted to mention before that, that we expect beliefs to be a little less important in terms of determining group choices, because in our case, we have uh, members communicating with each other before they take the action in the coordination game, which is a group choice game, right? Um, and this communication, as I mentioned before, can potentially reveal each other's preferences and also the actions that they would take. So let's have a quick look at how we think beliefs are going to uh, play a role in this setup. So let's um, let's consider uh, the three committee members. So these are, let's say, player one, player two, and player three. And let's see how player three is going to make uh, the choice of going with the kind option or the unkind option. Um, so let's say that this player is a selfish player and doesn't really want to go with a kind option. Um, so this player is going to think about what player one and player two would do. So let's chart out the beliefs that player three has about what player one would do, and that's on the x-axis, and also chart out the beliefs that player three has about what player, would, player two would choose. Um, and this is uh, in terms of choosing the unkind options. That's option M in the experiment. So then this uh, bold line here, this gives us an indifference threshold for coordination. Uh, and this is for player three. So the whole region under this curve 
is the region where the kind choice will be preferred. And the region about this is where the unkind, unkind choice would be preferred. And this is because even if player three is assumed to be selfish, she may choose kind if she believes that others in her group will choose to be kind. So that's how the beliefs um, channel would work. Now let's say that this particular player um, suffers some kind of a disutility from imposing a negative externality. And this can be captured by, let's say, these two simple dashed lines in this diagram. Um, and this disutility could differ by type. So depending on how much disutility you incur, uh, you might be on the green uh, threshold or the red one, and this could differ by your type or it could also differ by gender. So the region of beliefs for which the kind choice is now preferred is going to increase with the disutility. Okay, so it could be either the area under the red, um, red line or the, or the green line, depending on how much disutility you incur. So basically what that means is that if pro-social preference is sufficiently strong and subjects expect women to be kind more often than men, um, then a kind coordination game choice may be more often optimal in a group with more women. Okay, so that's the link that we think um, uh, between beliefs and uh, gender composition of the group. Maybe I should pause and ask for questions. Are there any more questions before I start showing you some results? Sure, Lata, there are quite a few. So uh, I'll go read out them for you. So the first one was, um, are there internal and external groups? How was this done? So that you have already explained. So we won't spend much time there. Um, the second one was, are the Z players known or visible to C? That also you have answered. The last one, which you might want to answer is, are you assuming that the communication through the electronic chat is equivalent to face-to-face -face communications? Um, yeah, so that's a good question uh, about communication. So we only have electronic chat communication here. So I can't tell you how does it differ from face-to-face. -face. Um, I assume there will be some differences, um, but uh, those differences, are more difficult to capture. So I think as a researcher, it's more easy to, um, so there are experiments where people have done face-to-face -face communication. And I think those have, you know, there, there are lots of insightful results that come out of those, but with the experiment, with the communication that we have, and I, I think an advantage is that we can, um, we can quantify it. So as you will see, I'll show you some results today about, uh, you know, coding of these uh, chat messages. And all of, the, all of that is much easier to do when you have um, electronic messages. Uh, in the real world, I think these days you have both kinds of messages. So you have lots of committees which communicate via email um, and other such things. So uh, I would say that both are relevant in, in the modern day. Uh, it's not just the face-to-face -face ones, but I assume that the face-to-face -face ones may have some additional characteristics as compared to the electronic one, which have other characteristics. Thank you. But we can discuss Steven, some of these more later. Yeah. yeah. Stephen has a bunch of other questions that I'll keep for the end. That's okay. Uh, if anyone else has any questions, that will be the time. Okay. So in the meantime, okay, so I'll, well, sorry. In the meantime can I ask a couple of quick questions about the model, right? So yeah. the one thing that I was worried about, you know, the, the rule that you use to finally come to the decision-making affects people's vote as well. So I'm thinking Condorcet theorem, right? So if it's a unanimous decision-making versus if it's a majority decision-making, I might change my behavior, right? Mm -hmm. And the mm -hmm. first one, the experiment that you described was unanimous, while mm -hmm. the second one where one is randomly picked to be the final decision is a majority decision rule. So, so how does that fit into the model? So that's one. And the other one that I quickly want to uh, get to is, so suppose the three of us in a committee decide to go with the coordinated action of being unkind, right? Mm -hmm. But then if one of us wants to defect from that, we are not only being kind to the, well, to the, to the Zs, but also being unkind to the Cs now, right? To the committee members. We are imposing an extra $2 of cost on them. And I didn't, like I, I couldn't see if that was modeled in the framework that you had. 
Uh, so that's a good point. So when we talk about kind and unkind, which is, so this is why we say unkind to Z and kind to Z, because that is the focus. You could argue exactly as you have argued that uh, you are being unkind to your own committee members when you choose uh, the other option, right? Uh, because they are losing some money because of your actions. Um, so, so that's precisely why we are <laughs> precise about how we define kind and unkind. It's always two Z, so that's our focus, okay? Um, yes, and in terms of the unanimity, and so yeah, so I think committees make different, have different kinds of rules. So if you think of, um, tenure committees or hiring committees, right? So in many departments, as you're aware, uh, hiring happens using a unanimous rule or a majority rule, right? So there are these town halls that you have in the, in the department for different kinds of um, votes <laughs> for different decisions. And some of them are basically unanimous. So everybody has to agree to this. And in some cases, it's a majority rule. So I think both are important rules. In the coordination game, we have used a unanimity rule uh, because often that's the uh, a common feature of coordination games. Uh, so I would say in the allocation task, it is basically just your preference. There's, there's no rule there. So uh, the, the rule that I mentioned was just for paying the subjects, right? So that's just the payment rule. But basically there, all we're trying to, it's actually similar to a dictator game where you're just indicating what your preferences are and you're going to be paid according to that, but not, not by coordinating with everybody else. But in the end, the Zs get paid based on a random pick, right? Of, amongst the three. Yes, right? yes. And yes. that makes it a majority game, right? So if there are two committee members who have decided to be unkind, then the chances of that happening is higher than the chances of a kind action happening. Okay, so you're thinking of it in terms of, the, yeah, okay, yeah. Probabilities, yeah. Yes, yes, yeah. So it's basically, you're just, you're trying to incentivize the C players so that you make sure that Literally. they reveal to you what they want to be truly done, right? Yeah. Um, and basically you just pick one of their decisions and implement that for the whole group. Fair, thank you. Okay, so let me keep moving and then hopefully we'll have some time for discussion at the end. So uh, overview of the results before I go into the details for each of them. So in terms of preferences, in terms of betas, what we find is that 45% make the kind choice in the allocation task. Uh, and in our sample, we don't find a significant uh, difference between men and women um, for, for the allocation task. In terms of the coordination game, we have data from 624 uh, coordination game choices. And out of this, 3% um, don't manage to coordinate. So they basically fail to agree. Uh, and what that means is everybody in the group um, gets zero earnings. 300 outcomes uh, were for the kind choice and 304 were for the unkind choice. So it's a, a, it's a similar proportion in some sense. In terms of beliefs, participants believe that 36% uh, of men and 46% of women uh, choose, the un choose the kind option. So let me uh, start by giving you some information about the relationship between the coordination game and um, the allocation task choices. And as we had expected, so it's consistent with the framework that I mentioned, um, the average rate of uh, kindness in the allocation choice is very much correlated with the average rate of uh, kindness in the coordination choice. So this is at the session level. So what you find is that there are, in some sessions, uh, the groups are more kind uh, in the coordination game, and in some sessions, actually, Four, four sessions maybe, they're kind of in the allocation choice. Now, when you start looking at the data uh, at the group level, so this is basically um, the group choice, depending on um, the, the types in the, in the allocation task, okay? So you should, the way to read this graph would be to look at how many people were kind? So these these are the sorry these were the groups where everyone in the group was unkind. So these are zero kind people in the group. Uh, so this is a bar which captures the data for groups where you have one kind person. Uh, 
Um, the next one is where you have two kind people in the group. And the last one is where you have three kind people in the group. The orange part of the graph tells us uh, the number of unkind options um, that were chosen in the group. And the red one is the kind option. Okay, so you can see that uh, in groups where you have more kind types, the group choice is also more kind. So you have higher proportion of reds as we progress along this graph. Okay, so the, the types do seem to make a big difference because groups where three members made kind individual allocations, um, they coordinated on the kind coordination game choice 93% of the time. So that's this part here. And, and opposite to that, so where you have zero kind members, uh, you have coordination game kind choices are just 10% here. Okay, so that's a big difference. So the kind types do matter. Now let's look at the same um, group choice data, uh, but now looking at the number of uh, women in the group. So here you have zero women in the group, one woman, two, and then three. And here the data is not as uh, dramatically differentiated. Uh, but you do see some difference in terms of uh, higher frequency of kind choices in groups where women are in the majority. So you have more red here as compared to this one, for example. Okay. And now let me um, connect the two ideas, the types and the gender. So this is basically data where we have majority women versus majority men groups. And this is differentiated now by the types, the kind types. And what we can see is that within the kind types, majority women groups. So these are these are this is a group where you have zero kind types. And the first bar tells us what happens in these groups when you have majority men in these groups, as compared to the second bar where you have majority women. And you can see that the red of these bars with majority women are higher. And that's true when you go to the next set of uh, groups where you have one kind type. So you have more red here as compared to here, similarly with the other one, et cetera. Okay, so this is less so here where you have three kind types. So here the difference is not really all that much. So basically within group types, there's a positive relationship between majority women in group and kind choices in the coordination game. So now let's um, look at the data a bit more systematically. So this is a regression where the dependent variable is, did group make the kind choice? Um, so here we have data in the first specification for uniform gender groups. Um, and what we find is that a group where you have all women, uh, they have a higher probability of making a kind choice uh, as compared to an all uh, male group. Um, the next specification looks at the number of women in the group. And again, you see that the number of women, as it's increasing, you have a higher proportion of kind choices being made uh, by the group. Um, and the last specification is about majority women. So the group, whether the group comprised of uh, majority women. And again, you see a similar relationship. Um, we also control for uh, the number in the group making a kind allocation choice. And as you can see, this is consistently a very important uh, aspect in terms of uh, the group making a kind choice, okay? So these are the preferences at the individual level. And what we are finding is that these individual level preferences have, uh, are really quite important in terms of the decisions made at the group level. Uh, and these are the rounds in which the information about gender is not provided. And you can see that this is not statistically significant. Um, so we do a few uh, other specifications for robustness. Um, not sure if I'll go into all of this in detail, but basically I just wanted to show you that we have specifications where we don't include the kind, the number of kind people in the group. We don't include sometimes the information provided dummy. So these are just you know more uh, simple specifications, but I showed you the more complete specification before. Uh, but the main point here is that in all of these different specifications, you get you know, mostly similar results and the coefficients 
us mostly similar. And also what is important is that this um, number of uh, kind types in the group is a consistent result. We always find that to be quite significant and the coefficients are very uniform all across, okay? So as I mentioned before, we had also uh, shown participants information about um, the season in which the other committee members were born. Um, and what we can do with that is to try and um, do a placebo test um, to try and contrast with a significant gender difference. Uh, of course, there is no theoretical reason to expect that birth timing would be correlated with subjects choices. Um, and when we look at the data, we find that that is so, there, there, is, no, there is no relationship. Uh, so what we do is we estimate the regressions that I just showed you before, um, but instead of the gender variables, what we do is we use the dummy variable for birth um, and we find that there is no impact of the birth timing in any of the specifications that I just showed you. Uh, it uh, also uh, being born in the first half of the year, uh, so the birth season does not correlate with the individual choice uh, allocations as well. Okay, so there is basically um, no relationship between this and our research question, um, which is, I, I guess, reassuring and comforting. Now let's look at beliefs. Um, so here I'm uh, showing you an overall um, relationship between beliefs and uh, group choice. So on the x-axis, we have the uh, actual rate of kind choice in the coordination game. So these are the kind choices that the subjects made in the coordination game. And here we're eliciting their beliefs of what they think other people have done in the experiment. So these are, these are people from other experiments, not in the same experiment. Um, and what we find is that there is a very positive, very strong uh, positive correlation between these two. Um, and in the and we also actually indicate whether they whether these beliefs are about men or women. So the red dots are about uh, the beliefs that women choose the kind option, and the blue or the gray dots are uh, whether men choose the kind option. And you can see that pretty much in every session that we have. So these are the two data points for this session, let's say. And you can see that the beliefs about women choosing the kind choice is higher in pretty much all sessions, right? As compared to the men. Okay, so that's at the overall session level. Let's now explore this gender difference in beliefs a little more. And let me first show you uh, the beliefs about the percentage of men who choose kind option overall and by gender, comp gender composition. So this is the number that I just showed you. So this is overall, what do, we, what do both men and women expect men to do? Do they choose the kind option or not, right? So here you have uh, that 36% of men are expected to choose the kind option. And now let's see what happens when there is a different gender composition in these groups. So let's start with a uniform group. So in a, this is a group uh, of three men. And um, the question here that they're being asked is what would men do when they're in a group like this? Okay. So, and this is the response of all the subjects, both men and women. Now let's go from this group and move to this group, which is next group, which is a mixed group. And here we are going to replace um, one man with one woman. And you can see that the beliefs that men would choose a kind choice in a group like this goes up. Now let's go up further. And here we're going to replace two men with two women. And again, you can see that progressively the beliefs go up. So there's a monotonic relationship between the number of women in the group and the beliefs that people have about their choices about the choices of men when they are in groups like this. Now let's look at what are the kind of beliefs that people have about the choices women make when they are in these different groups, uniform groups versus mixed gender groups. So again, let's start with the overall data. So this is the data that we saw before. And again, you know, we know that uh, overall women are expected to choose kind options at a higher rate. Uh, so this is a uniform group now where you have three women and um, the belief is that 48% of women are going to choose the kind option in such a group. 
Now let's replace uh, one woman with one man. And you can see the beliefs going down. And again, when we replace two uh, women with two men, you can see the beliefs going further down. Okay. What you also notice is that uh, here the, sleep, the slope is much more uh, steep as compared to the slope here. Okay. So, so basically, uh, just to summarize the results from these two graphs, uh, subjects believe that men will become more kind as more women are included in the group. And there's a 10 percentage points effect per woman. Uh, they believe that women will become less kind with more women and sorry, with more men in the group. And the difference here is a, is a three or four percentage points effect per man. So that's this slope, which is a bit uh, you know, less as compared to the slope. Uh, we also have regressions, and I think I have a slide on that uh, next. Uh, and what we show there is that these shifts are significant, and there is no difference based on who is responding, whether it's a man or a woman responding to these questions. So both men and women believe that these shifts are quite important. That is, a gender composition is really important. Okay. Um, right. So this is where we have. Uh, the regression on beliefs. So here, the dependent variable is the difference between the beliefs relating to men and women. Uh, and it's the constant term here that is interesting. Um, and what we find is that men are expected to be um, about nine to 18 percentage points less kind than women overall and in uniform gender groups. In mixed gender, it's a little less clear. Okay. Um, and this is true irrespective of whether it's male or female respondents. So both male and female subjects seems to have a similar kind of uh, uh, beliefs. And it is also true. So we asked these questions to type Z subjects as well. So both type C and type Z subjects answered these questions. And again, you don't see much of a difference depending on what position or what type you are. Okay, so I talked about how with our online chat sessions, we can analyze the chat data. So let me just go through a bit, uh, a bit about the procedure that we use to analyze this data. I have to apologize. We haven't finished analyzing this data. We actually just collected all this data, you know, last month and we haven't, um, thanks to lockdown and labs being shut everywhere, it's been really quite hard to finish the data collection process. Uh, so our RAs are still coding this data, um, but I'm going to show you some data from the pilot. So I'll first talk about the procedure and then I'll talk about um, the data, the, the results from this procedure. Okay, so um, you know this already, position C participants could send messages to each other. Um, now, what do we do with these messages? We try and quantify them. So we employ three coders to read and classify these lines of chat. So we have approximately 6,000 lines of chat in the 624 chat rooms. Uh, so we train these coders separately and they, are, they code these statements independently. They are not aware of the research questions that are being addressed in this uh, study. So they are blind to the research hypotheses um, and they don't know the subject's decisions. So they just get to see the chat messages. They also get to read the instructions that the subjects saw. So they know what the kind and the unkind options mean. What does M mean and what does J mean? Then they understand that. But they don't know what are the actual uh, decisions that the subjects have taken in the experiment. Um, so what the coders have to do is they have to judge whether each individual chat line fits into uh, different categories. So we give them 15 categories and I'll just show you what those categories were. Uh, and the individual chat lines could be assigned to many different categories. And then what we do is we try to assess how reliable are these classification categories. And we do this uh, by using this measure called Cohen's Kappa which helps to net out the level of coder agreement, which can sometimes occur simply by chance. So this is basically just to figure out if the um, uh, classification is reliable or not. So let me show you some examples from these chat messages. Uh, so many of the messages were about the choice between M and uh, J, because obviously, and that makes sense actually, because, you know, their job is to coordinate on one or the other and their payoffs depend on that. So as expected, many of the messages were about that. And some of them were just simple, you know, M question mark, J question mark. Um, and some would say, so these are the actual uh, 
um, statements that that we saw in the data. So I've just taken it out verbatim. Um, some of them are a bit more expansive. So they ask whether you want to coordinate or you want to choose J, we should, or they suggest let's choose J or let's choose M. Um, so obviously there were lots of messages of this kind. Um, there are also messages where concerns were expressed for player Z's earnings, welfare or well-being. Uh, so, for example, this is rough for the Z players. I'm feeling sorry for type Z. I'm thinking the two points isn't that big of a deal. Let's give Z something, right? So, and then they're suggesting J. There are also messages where they mention money, uh, trying to get the most money for the group. We make the decision, so we should get the money. Um, and then there was another message which said, we are trying to make money, not give it to someone else, choose M. So, so they're very, very specific. Some of these messages are very specific and obviously they're recommending um, the specific options M or J. So here are the 15 categories um, that we have in terms of classification. And as you can see, uh, the plan for us is to look at the frequency of each of these uh, classific, or each of these, um, you know, how many times these statements were said in, and, and they could be classified in this particular category. And then we're going to compute the Cohen's Kappa. So this is actually just from the pilot data because as I just said, the new data is being coded as we speak. Uh, but the idea would be to um, calculate this for the new data as well. Okay, so, but from the pilot, you can see that there were lots of mentions. So let's look at the frequency. So, you know, so this one here is 15%. So this is basically mentioning the choice M, uh, mentions choice J, that is 7% here, right? Uh, then there are others where you're agreeing. So somebody suggests M or J, and then another subject is agrees to the previous message in the group. So there's a lot of that happening. So that's 35%, 25%. 10% agrees with J, agrees with M, et cetera, okay? Um, so I hope you get a sense of how we are going to use this data um, and how actually it's quite a, quite a lot of rich data. And what we saw from the pilots is that there were significant gender differences in terms of uh, what people said in these uh, chat messages. So the concerns about uh, Z's welfare was much was more often expressed by women, which is this orange line here, as compared to men. Mentions of money were more often mentioned by men as compared to women. Um, so it was more frequent to see women asking uh, for advice or asking for suggestions. So you know it would be statements like, "What do you think we should do?" Uh, so this was more often done by women as compared to men. We saw in our data. Also, in terms of references to the kind choice, uh, we see that there are more women who refer to the kind choice, either in terms of agreeing to a previous statement which mentions J. Um, and then here we um, add both of them, mentions of J or agrees with J. So he, there are some indications that maybe there is a gender difference in terms of the chat messages. So in conclusion, most of the important decisions made in organizations involve some kind of group decision-making and some kind of communication. Uh, what we find is that social preferences of group members are a key determinant of the group's coordination choice. Each kind person increases the likelihood of a kind outcome by the group by 30 percentage points. That's a big um, magnitude, I would say. And groups with more women are about 10 percentage points more likely to make choices uh, that are kinder to the external party in our experiment. And this effect becomes stronger when controlling for social preferences of the group. Uh, both men and women believe that women will make kinder choices more frequently. Men are expected to be uh, nine to 18 percentage points less kind as compared to women overall and in uniform gender groups. So we basically um, find evidence of a stereotype bias and beliefs uh, that both men and women think that women are going to be more kind. In terms of uh, implications, 
organizations which seek to um, have specific objectives or seek to promote uh, corporate social responsibility initiatives uh, may see greater success if uh, women participate in greater decision-making roles. At least that's what our experiment seems to suggest. What we also find is that uh, beliefs about gender differences and choices are exaggerated. That is, people think women to be more kind than what they actually are, right? So, so in our data, for example, uh, it's 18 percentage points in terms of beliefs, whereas in terms of actual actions, it's just about 10 percentage points, uh, gender difference. Right? We think that is actually quite interesting. Um, so there is quite a bit of exaggeration in terms of beliefs. Um, in terms of uh, group choices in the coordination game, number of kind individuals is actually a very important determinant of group choice. So it's not just the number of women in the group that is important, the, the number of kind people in the group is also important. And actually, in our data, the magnitudes are much greater for the number of kind people making you know, different decisions at the group level. So, so depending on the objectives of the organization, it seems useful uh, for organizations to attract different kinds of employees and diversity being defined along many different dimensions, many broad dimensions, and not just with respect to gender. Of course, gender is an important aspect of it. And maybe because gender is observable and kindness is not observable, gender becomes a proxy for kindness in some sense. Um, and uh, perhaps, you know, so, so definitely gender diversity is an, an important objective, uh, but I guess it's also important for organizations to think beyond that. And we already see some evidence of that. There is this idea of cognitive diversity where uh, organizations, some, at least some progressive organizations are trying to hire people who have uh, different approaches to solving a problem, different perspectives. Um, and all of which uh, hopefully improves decision making in the organization. And, and of course, gender is part of it, but you know, that's, that's not the only dimension that we should be thinking about. So that's all I have to say. All right. Thank you, Lata. And so what I'll do now is I'll formally end the meeting because you're on the talk and then we'll, 